we will start off uh, this morning with our first plenary. Um, caring for the environment is caring for patients. I'm going to ask Dr. Naomi Glick to come up, and she's going to introduce the speakers. Dr. Naomi Glick is a clinical nephrologist who lives and works in central Vancouver Island. She has local administrative leadership roles within Island Health and Kidney Care Clinic and transplant settings. Her clinical interests include nephrology outreach with a focus on risk reduction among underserviced rural and remote communities. Dr. Glick is inspired by her colleagues in planetary health to develop a sustainable model for nephrology care in which patient-centered care and global sustainability align. And I personally just like her name. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. So it's a pleasure and honor to introduce this plenary session, Caring for the Environment is Caring for Patients. The two speakers, Chief Rakalma and Dr. Stigant, are dear colleagues and friends in unique ways. Chief Rakalma is a respected, elected chief of the Qualicum First Nation. He's an elder, a father, a spouse, an educator, and like many, a kidney disease warrior. Chief Rakalma's kidney journey started with acute Kidney, excuse me, kidney failure approximately five years ago. He required urgent dialysis and since then has transitioned between in-center community and home dialysis therapies, and most recently, a renal transplant. And in so doing, he's worked and learned alongside innumerable renal-related health professionals and fellow renal patients. His resilience and that of his family exemplify his leadership in his communities. Dr. Stigant is a leader in the green, in the field of green nephrology and planetary health. She is a mother and daughter, excuse me, she's a mother to daughter and dog alike, mm -hmm. an avid gardener and a nephrologist based in Victoria, BC. Significant to this talk and audience, Dr. Stigant is the medical lead for planetary health in BC Reno. Sustainability is now a foundational principle for the 2023-2028 BC Renal Strategic Plan. And Dr. Stigant is uniquely suited to this role as a physician lead on the Climate Change Steering Committee at Island Health, a co-investigator with UBC Planetary Healthcare Lab to study the environmental impact of kidney therapies, and in the inaugural chair of the Sustainable Nephrology Action Planning Committee, SNAP. She is also the representative of the CSN in the Green Kidney Initiative of the International Society of Nephrology. Dr. Stephen. Perfect. I just need some key equipment there. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Stephanie. All right. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Chief Okama has uh, kindly provided us with uh, the following disclosures. And uh, these are my disclosures. I list conventional disclosures first, and I choose to include some less conventional disclosures. I think that we need openness, clarity, honesty, and education about our personal impact as well as our professional impact. So I've uh, included there my footprint. I'm working very hard to get it to net zero and in a fossil fuel based economy, it is very difficult to do. For those of you who may think that I'm on the extinction rebellion side, given that second lower bullet signatory of fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, it took me a while to feel comfortable putting that in the slide, but that is actually now endorsed by all of the faculties of medicine across Canada. So this is mainstream. And I want to just point out that the truth can be difficult, but part of this spiritual part for me is acknowledging truth and where we are. And so I just want to recognize that some of the things I'm going to talk about are uncomfortable. These are today's objectives, which I believe you are familiar with. And I'm happy to hand it over to Chief Michael. Thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, I, my name is Michael Rickelm. I'm the Director Chief of Qualcomm First Nation. But I want to start this, this morning by thanking the people who came to my aid yesterday morning, uh, starting with a young man in the washroom that helped me when I was having a horrible, horrible nosebleed. Uh, I don't know if he's in the room today or not, but there was also uh, Dr. Glick who came in and Dr. Duncan, who came to my room and to make sure that I was all right, and to my wife, Sharon, who's always making sure I'm all right. But um, it, it's, and the security team, the security team from the, from the hotel, they, they were immaculate. They were, they, they went above and beyond as far as I'm concerned to, to make sure that I was, I was okay and getting the care that I would need. So that's my thank you for them. Now, I, I want to be really especially acknowledge the fact that I as am on the NC's territory of the, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nation. I do have ties to Musqueam. My mother's from there. So I'm kind of coming home again to where my mother was from. So that's it, an honor. And I want to thank uh, the people who invited me to this. And you know who you are. I was I was voluntold. And, uh, <laughs> and, and that's fine. I... I I also want to thank everybody for, for even taking the time to listen to what I have to say. Ever since I failed and, and I decided to come forward with my knowledge and the Indigenous component of care that probably didn't exist, and, and it's changing, the world is changing for the better. And, and what I'm going to say today we must all remember that probably 10, 15 years ago would never happen. We would be afraid to say it. You would be afraid to hear it. Um, because really, in, in reality, you cannot have reconciliation without knowing the truth. It's a cultural thing that's been practiced for thousands of years, and, and it continues to this day. And I also want to remind people that a lot of times, uh, the, the millennials, the, the, the age class, probably doesn't even know it themselves because once the residential schools got finished with us, they didn't, they stopped teaching those beliefs. Some of us practiced it. My son knows it, my son practices it, but a lot of community members don't know what's out there, don't know how to ask for help in a cultural, spiritual way. And, and that's important for any, any culture, really. It's um, when you lose it, it's gone forever. When, when people of my generation are gone, so is the knowledge. I always think back to my son saying, Dad, when you're dead, I'm not chopping your head off. I'm, I'm, I want the knowledge now. And, and again, it, it's got to be shared to be understood. And to be understood, it's got to be shared. So that, that's my little, that's, that's as Sharon said to Dr. Duncan, we wrote the speech and I'm not going to follow it. <laughs> But I'll start now. I'm here today to talk about spiritual self-care, finding balance between spiritual well-being and modern medicine in the, in the indigenous world. Many of BC's hospitals now have sacred or healing spaces. These work well in the, in the hospital situation, but the same token, they're gone. These work well in the hospital situation. By the same token, when the outside, when we're outside of the hospital, or at, or at home during your own self-care, there are other ways and methods to accomplish the same thing. Sacred rooms can be found in many of BC's hospitals. Oh, to look after to look after emotional trauma. You may, be, you may be suffer, may be suffered. While the hospital system is becoming more aware and respective of the need for cultural healing, by providing the healing rooms, cultural liaisons, and cultural healers, there is still a lack of understanding the benefits and the needs of indigenous patients. Again, that sort of go back to the fact that sometimes the patient doesn't really know what he needs or wants. There's a difference between needing it, what you need, and what you want. We must also remember that through no fault of their own, many indigenous patients have lost touch with their culture or, or may have difficulty knowing what to ask for. 
this is where the indigenous liaisons to be a, can be a very effective bridge in being able to communicate my needs for traditional healing and modern medicine methods. I've spoken with indigenous liaisons at several hospitals, including NRGH, St. Paul's, and Jubilee. And now I can, I didn't put in, uh, we didn't we, in we, yeah, we didn't request one in general. It was we were, They were kind of busy, as, as was I. Um, each of these experiences were unique to the individual hospital. However, when it came time for the cultural support, there was in, the, it was there when I needed it. The first time I used a healing room was after a traumatic experience in my hospital room, which required a seat of brushing, which is where the, the, you find the person to, to literally just brush you with cedar boughs. It took some time to find the appropriate cultural person to do this work. Um, I requested, I, again, like I said, you must know what you need. They initially wanted to smudge me, but that isn't what I wanted. I knew I knew I needed a brushing to, to brush away the, the effects of what had happened in that room. And, and smudging was not going to be it. It, it was the removal that way. It's very important to recognize that there are different practices and different methods for cleansing the mind, body, or, and soul, where there are who prefer smudging we, by using sweet grass or sage, and, other, and others brush with cedar boughs. Uh, there's those pictures there. They are, you'll see the, the abalone shell, the large shell with the smudge sticks in it. Uh, you'll see some, um, a, f a feather, that's what you brush the legs with. And you'll also see there a raven rattle. That's something that, believe it or not, you will never see that in somebody's possession. Uh, I have one, but you'll never see that other than in a, a museum setting. They, they, they're very special people that own those, own those, um, those rattles for, for that's for, for, again, another method of cleaning, but it's uh, it's just like using any drugs where you use what you is needed at that point in time, and that's found out by the person cleansing you by talking with them. How deep is this hurt? How deep is this trauma? Where is it lying? How do we get it out of you? Is it in your heart or is it in your soul? Or is it is it systematic? Where is it? It, it's to be found, and, and this is where a lot of the conversations come. But again, knowing, for me, we're always knowing what I needed at, at any given point in, in my spiritual health care. Another way of cleansing at home, in a home environment, is, is water. Uh, cleansing in a pool, a pool of water, uh, with cedar boughs brushing yourself going in, but the pool of water is done. You just go in, immerse, face to the east, and when you, the pool, but the end of the pool must have a ripple because when you let those boughs go, there goes your trauma. There goes your hurt, there goes your pain. It's done that way. So again, it, 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 it's out of you. It's gone back to the, to the just water is very cleansing. But as you know, water can also be very dangerous, but you're using it in its cleansing form, and that's in a river, in the ocean, it's done the same where you immerse, face to the east, and dip four times, because four, four is a very important number to us. There's four, there's four directions, there's four winds, there's four posts holding up your house, in a big house. So again, all these things are, are very, very, it's, it's customs that are as old as time. The healthcare professionals are frequently surrounded by negative emotions from your environment, which will drain your energy and challenge your immune system. Cleansing yourself is important, is as important as the as the patient. And and that is known by what when when I was taken down and my nephrologist got brushed and she just said it, it just felt what a difference. And again, finding somebody to do that. And again, accepting the fact that 
maybe it'll work. You need to go in with that. It all depends on your mindset. As I going into the water in November, December, you go in with a mindset going, if you know you're going to be just cleansing yourself, it's not that cold. Because it's not. It's, it's cleansing. You're cleansing your spirit. You're cleansing your soul. We have a ceremony in our culture called Tiha, which washes away those things that don't belong to you, whether it's pain, shock, or someone has trespassed against you. It returns your spirit back to you, only if you agree never to look back. Because if, you look, if you're looking back on the place of trauma, you will trip. Because you are, you cannot see where you're going. You are only feeding. You are not only feeding yourself, but you're sp feeding your spirit as well. When at home, my place of, of healing is the river, where simply watching the water, or often bathing in the river, has a cleansing effect on the spirit. And not chilling because the experience is the body's healing to the river and the 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 birds running, the birds speaking to each other, and the rustle. The rustle of the trees and the forest is a very calming experience. One experience I had when I speak about the, the um, ocean and where you find your, your calming space is when I was, I had gone through um, Hemo PD, back to Hemo, and I sat at the beach and, and wondered, what haven't I done? Why am I being punished like this? What, what's missing? What am, I, what am I missing in my message from the Creator? And what it was, if any of you have seen the pictures of me doing the videos, you will see my ponytail comes down to here. It, it had grown for 25 years because in our world we say that a man with long hair, that's his strength. And what I realized was I had forgotten one thing. I had done everything properly. When I finished... Um, hemo the first time, what you do is when that traumatic experience happens, you burn everything. You burn it. Um, you wear the same clothes, you wear the same shoes, you wear everything's the same. You take it and burn it down at the beach. You have witnesses with you, and then it, it's gone. People have seen that. They now accept the fact that this is what you did. It's done. The same thing with my, my, when my PD failed, the same thing happened. We cleansed it. Um, but when I was at the beach, I realized I had never cut my hair. So I cut my hair off. Same thing, we did the ceremony. We burned it um, with, with uh, female witnesses. And then within three weeks, I got the call. Coincidence? Doesn't matter. I, I finished that part of my life. It was time to move on, transplant. And uh, it, it, it just happens. Um, I don't know where we want to go from here. Um, oh, we were, yeah, we were supposed to the environment, sorry. <laughs> That's why I'm, I'm not here to talk about spiritual I'm about the environment too. I, I kind of wind up in my own culture and forget about boxes. <laughs> we didn't have boxes. We had cedar boxes. So when 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 I went on to PD, oh, I you know when when I was on hemo first, and all I saw was the machine with the, the tubes and the, the the jugs jugs of, of um, fluid, and that's all I saw. You know, you you don't. I didn't imagine how much garbage I was generating in each session. And then when I went on PD, I went, holy crap. It's, <laughs> it's, it's 40 boxes a month. You know, and the plastic, some was recyclable, some was not. And the tubes, but the cardboard was. And it was just amazing. And the, the box, I was very fortunate because there was uh, people building an earth ship in community. And the Baxter boxes are very uniform, very strong. So they took all I could have all they could take, but then again, that ran out, so now you just cut them up and recycle them. But again, a lot of work. 
Uh, you've got to spend the time to cut them. You got to transport them to the recycle depot. And and when I was back on on um, Hemo, it was the same route, not similar the same routine. But now you've got somebody driving you. You've got 40, 50 kilometers every day. And, you know, plus that, that person, if it was my wife or my brother or my, you know, one of my friends, and when you're on Hemo, believe me, you burn out every friend you've ever had because it's just four hours is a long time to, to do nothing, you know, three times a week. So we, we had a, a contractor drive us, drive me back and forth, but it's the same thing. They would go from Nanaimo to pick me up in Gualica, back to Portal Burning or back to Nanaimo. So there's like upwards of 200 kilometers a day. That's a lot of fuel. That's a lot of, you know, um, carbon. The whole thing, the whole thing is just, is just a energy sucking routine. And it, energy, time, the whole, the whole nine yards. And the, the plastic was fine until this, the, the recycling people just said, okay, no more of that. I presume what was going on there was wherever they were disposing it to, didn't want it anymore either. I know a lot of times the plastic would be going to the state somewhere. And uh, again, it's just, you know, economically, it's not a money maker, it's a money loser. And, and in this case, the environment's the real loser. The environment and us and our future generations they're losing not, not the immediate, it's later. It's constant. You see it all now with the climate change. You know, you see the dead trees all the time, the cedar trees, which is the root of our of our culture. You know, a lot of them are dying. It just it just happens. You know, but but in the city there's not many trees. But where I live there's lots. But again, you see you see the damage, you see we all seen the wildfires. You know, it, it's just, it's a disaster, and it's getting worse. So where, the, where that's going to continue, continue on to, I have no idea. But um, it, it's a mess we're leaving for our next generation, and I really feel sorry for them. Okay, my wife's saying wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> we start, when we rehearsed this last night in the emergency room, it took like seven minutes. I think I've gone over. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the amazing perspective, and we'll have a chance to have a discussion um, towards the end, but um, we'll try to feed off some of the learnings and wisdom there in, uh, in our approach. So in the top right-hand corner is uh, a graphic from the National Health System of the UK, which is where I usually start these talks. It, it, it's a little bit small, but on the left side is a graphic of their uh, ki a kidney care program within the UK. And this was 2010. This is a while ago. Um, it wasn't using the most updated techniques, but you can see they're kind of mirror images of each other, but they say the same thing globally and within kidney care. Uh, the majority majority of healthcare related emissions happen upstream from what we do. And when we focus in on what we do directly in our facilities, it's the energy use in our facilities, it's the waste that we generate in our facilities, and it's transporting patients and ourselves to and from those facilities. So those are our big themes. Medical uh, or medications rather is in there. We can't say too much about that because we don't know much about it. That's really proprietary data. So I'm leaving it out because I, there's not much more I can say on it, but I'm I'm hoping there's a lot more in that realm in the years to come. So this Dorset renal service um, had emissions of 3,007 tons CO2 per year. That's a community um, a catchment area about the size of Victoria, so similar to where I work. Um, and 3,007 tons, uh, if that doesn't mean anything to you, is about the emissions of a medium-sized average hospital in Canada. So that's their one program, uh, a year's worth of an entire hospital. Uh, I think even more uh, informingly, uh, they looked at their 277 people who were on peritoneal and hemodialysis, and they realized that the, the dialysis patients of 
all the renal patients um, captured about two thirds of the emissions. So disproportionately more. And they discovered that this population had uh, a carbon impact 18 times more uh, than a general uh, average medical patient. So that's sort of the best we have for the, the uh, extent of the big scale impact in kidney care. So if there's any of our corporate partners in the room, I invite you to take special attention to this slide because right now kidney programs are starting to, in some parts of the world, um, notably in Europe, collect some key performance indicators on environmental metrics. Um, and to me, it, make, it both makes a lot of sense and doesn't make a lot of sense because I think we know what we're going to find. Um, that you, bought, you purchase a machine and you're locked into the consumables that come with that machine. You're locked in with the energy expended and with the water requirement. So I've shown here a PD cycler and hemodialysis machine. So what I'd love to see is uh, like the EV version, like we need an EV version of a dialysis machine, a rethink, like just ways that we can lessen the impact of all of these things. But as we'll hear, we of course need prevention as well. So uh, you don't have to read all of this, but I wanted everybody to be aware in case you're not aware, in Canada here, we have, some, and in BC as well, we have multiple um, health agreements, international ag agreements, provincial agreements, uh, and then academic level stuff and UN level stuff that says that we're to get to net zero. And I'm very motivated by this Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act challenge, which goes to all sectors calling for credible science-based emissions reductions plans. So whose goal is that? Who is doing that? That's for all of us to take on and to do. There's no stick saying, there's no one saying we're gonna enforce this, you've gotta to get to net zero. This is something that we have to do on our own. So I took a stab at a definition of environmentally sustainable kidney care. And this definition is in evolution. It's, it doesn't exist in the literature, but I, I thought it was really important to put conversations at the beginning. And so here I'm just grateful to have this forum and to have one giant opening conversation um, in our community on this topic. And as we become more sophisticated uh, with, with uptake of, uh, I want you to know the acronym because I'm going to use it in subsequent slides, ESKC environmentally sustainable kidney care uh, that hopefully will be moving more towards practice and product side where we can actually functionally make a difference. So right now, these other aspects of this definition that I'm just showing you here are what I would call highly aspirational and ideal. This is a graphic which was taken from our editorial uh, in um, Kidney International that basically um, called the global nephrology community to action and said that this needs to be an area of specific practice um, within kidney care. Uh, I, I want to just point out a number of things on this slide. The first, if anyone here thinks that we're omitting patient care or cutting corners on patient care so that we can quote care for the environment, you're very mistaken. And I want everyone to really, really understand that this is a quality improvement initiative that's looking at delivering the same optimized care that we all strive to deliver to our patients where they can choose. But we ought to know the impact of these therapies and we ought to improve the efficiencies in our systems and to do better in an era of climate change. So the, the green line there, I wanna stress that optimal outcome always comes from prevention. It always comes from health promotion. It always comes from having less disease and healthier lifestyle. So where are we working within our kidney system where we can impact that? I don't care if you're sitting with a dialysis patient who's been on dialysis for decades and has had amputations and MIs. There is still room for health promotion for that patient. There's still room for consideration of a medical regimen, what medications are maybe appropriate to de-prescribe for that patient. Or if you're in the kidney care clinic setting or transplant clinic setting, they, would, they may be different conversations that you're having. Um, so uh, just to think about the kind of conversations that you could meaningfully engage with patients. So optimal outcome, you can see at the top of the triangle there, the best kidney health also has the lowest environmental impact. So we're talking a lot about mitigation or preventing climate change issues from getting worse, lowering our emissions, but in the adaptation as well, we want to make sure that our care systems are resilient to all the horrible things that are happening. So if the supply chain stops, our patients aren't going to be left with without resources. So this, this ha happens to all align, which is wonderful. Lowest cost, best outcome for patients, best environmental outcome, and most climate resilient. 
So we're starting to see engagement at all levels. So I mentioned the uh, ISN level uh, nationally. Um, we've got a great group of uh, nephrologists, patient partners, and pharmacists um, on our SNAP committee, working with other aspects of the CSN, really trying to bring up uh, the expertise and create a community of practice in this area within Canada. And we've got very strong partners with Cascades Canada. Probably most of you haven't heard of Cascades, but I'm gonna ask if everyone can at some point today, please, before you forget, have a look at their website, cascadescanada.ca. So this is, a, it's a knowledge building um, and a tremendous uh, uh, initiative that is looking at implementing low carbon um, care throughout the Canadian healthcare system, not just within kidney, but we're really pleased with SNAP to be partnering with them and developing the kidney specific resources. Um, provincially, very effective graphic here that is imprinted in my brain um, from Health Quality BC, where you can see this environmentally sustainability just moving through all of the other aspects of patient care. And then here we are wonderfully at BC Renal with these new strategic vision, including environmental sustainability. So this is a graphic from the Green K work. So the Green K is the working, the acronym for the working group for the International Society of Nephrology. So this is a, a new um, group of people working to solve this problem on the international level. So there, there's a, a lot of work um, being made right now about what the education should look like. Should there be certification? What should be included? Should it be targeted, to, you know, different education streams to different types of providers or practitioners? Um, the procurement stream, I think, holds the greatest um, potential for change because we're going to bring people together from all over the world to have conversations about what we want in terms of products and processes. Um, there will be um, procurement uh, template documents that have built in um, social, environmental, uh, sustainability um, uh, features that are vetted by experts so that we can, again, level the playing field for procurement. We can speak a common language and we can all ask for better products. So when a market is guaranteed, we would incentivize producers to change their products. And then, of course, um, education and uh, widespread implementation, sharing and amplification of successful, sustainable clinical pathways. Within the SNAP committee, our mission on the right-hand side is like a guiding vision for me um, to educate, innovate, and advocate for sustainable kidney care. So we're in Canada, but happy to inform our international partners as well. I won't read through these, but there's a list of uh, some of the things that's kept us busy. We've been in existence now for a year and nine months. So I'm really proud of the um, track record and the, and the busy work that uh, our group has done. And I'll point uh, at the bottom there, the Cascades collaboration. There's an infographic that we've put together called 10 Steps to Sustainability. So you can imagine this is complex to make your um, program sustainable. Uh, so they're thematic areas. It's not sort of a single one item where you can check off the box, but uh, I would encourage all of you to look at that. It's on the BC Renal Environmental Sustainability page, and it's also on that Cascades Canada site. We're in the process of converting that to what's called a playbook, which is like a complete manual, an online manual. It's gonna be wonderful. It's got annotations to all of the resources worldwide. So it's sort of a one-stop shop for um, sustainability. So stay tuned for that coming out, hopefully within a couple of months. So very grateful to BC Renal uh, for the funding of this project. Um, we are doing in collaboration with um, some of my surgical colleagues at UBC and the UBC Planetary Healthcare Lab and also UBC Okanagan uh, Engineering, um, a series of studies called Life Cycle Assessments. Most people haven't heard of that. It's sort of traditionally in the engineer's realm. But a, a brief overview of life cycle assessment is very much as it sounds. You look at uh, on the left in the sort of blue gray graphic there, we're looking at the environmental impact from something as it's mined out of the ground to when it's made and assembled to how it's used, it's decomposed, and then how it has its final decomposition into earth, air, or water. And so we want to look at a whole range of environmental impact categories, and that's the richness of this methodology. For the purposes of today's discussion, we're just going to be talking about um, on the box to the right, the climate change one. So that's so-called carbon footprinting. That's probably what most people are familiar with. But there's a lot of other things that we need to keep our eye on here as well. Atmospheric carbon pollution causing global warming is understandably at the top of our list. But what are we doing to our water systems with plastic waste? What are we doing to our uh, freshwater systems or aquatic life with certain medications? 
So that being said, unfortunately, we cannot include medications in our analyses because I did mention at the beginning, we do not have any data on that. So one of the things we'd like Green K to do is to have um, em environmental data on every healthcare product that comes into the country so that at some level these can be vetted and we can decide which products are preferred, um, obviously, um, that are still clinically required. So this is a summary of our World Congress of Nephrology uh, poster, and um, we sought to do this uh, environmental impact assessment on comparing uh, deceased donor kidney transplantation, um, in-center hemodialysis, and cycler peritoneal dialysis. So the brown box in the middle on the top, the climate change impact, is the bottom line finding. Hemodialysis has 91% more climate change impact than transplant. So this is the process. This is um, a patient coming into the hospital, the surgery to extract the donor kidney um, from the donor, the implantation surgery, the time in hospital for um, both the donor and the recipient, uh, it, the entire first year of follow-up coming into clinics. Um, and, and that does not include blood work and that does not include medications. Um, similarly for hemodialysis, it does not include blood work and it does not include medications. So we don't have that data just yet. But I think you'll agree, it's quite a shocking disparity. And this is just within the first year when we've got the emissions of a surgery to consider. So as you know, patients are stable post-transplant and they're having less frequent blood work, less frequent follow-up, that difference is gonna be amplified. 65% more than um, for, for hemodialysis than cycler peritoneal dialysis as well. So that comes uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, that most impact due to transport and consumables. And I think those are really take home, good take-home messages as well. We, we, go, we were kind of sad when we saw that transport um, was one of the highest emissions categories because we thought, oh, we don't want to draw away from you know, the therapy itself and improvements that could happen within the therapy itself. But the data speaks and transportation to the center is really an important lever in terms of electrifying transport promoting home dialysis therapies, considering ourselves having low carbon ways of getting into our places of work. So um, I've put it here because these numbers I know are not intuitive that the equivalent driving distance of a standard vehicle um, for each of these therapies for one year. So orders of magnitude difference. And again, this is um, just in the first year of therapy. So this is uh, not yet published. We're just working on um, cleaning up data for that and for this assessment. But um, home hemodialysis has about a fifth of the climate change impact of in-center hemodialysis. Um, so stay tuned for PD data, which is coming up. So I thought we'd just have a quick pause here at the lessons learned. Again, remember that hierarchy with a triangle. So the hierarchy of greenhouse gas emissions fully aligns with existing dialysis prescribing hierarchy and care costs. Transplant is preferred to PD, which is preferred to home hemo, the next stage system. Um, I didn't display that clearly on the last slide, but it did show that the emissions are lower with next stage than they are with the conventional first pass dialysis system. Um, and then in term for, for in-center hemodialysis. Consumables have big impact. So again, we're stuck with those consumables for as long as we're stuck with the machine. Transportation, I talked about that. Um, this is one which is more of a societal level thing, but again, care providers as health advocates, I think we do have a role to speak out um, to promote an energy, a green energy transition. Um, and system level problem solving, obviously it's going to be required for um, issues of this scale. So we have just submitted an abstract on peritoneal dialysis data, and I'm not ready to show you the LCA data just yet for PD, but we did uh, in our center um, with another nephrologist, a couple of nephrologists quantify the um, weight um, of peritoneal dialysis plastic. So just speaking to your experience, Chief Rakama, of how much plastic is thrown out, wouldn't it be great if we could recycle some of that? So we did an analysis for BC because we wanted to inform our local recycling infrastructure Here's the amount of product you could recycle. Recycling is a business. They want a steady supply of a good quality product. So if we can provide them that, um, there, there's odds are that we can manage these things better. So the, the amounts you can see, the world data, 30 million kilograms of PVC plastic per year from PD. Like quite unacceptable, isn't it? 
So um, I, I'll just skip through these um, lessons, but uh, number four, obviously waste management systems are needed, but again, a plug for the richness of the life cycle assessment data, because um, I'm, I'm just gonna gloss over this in, uh, in, in the interest of time, but the carbon metric isn't the right metric here. If we were recycling versus landfilling, we, we should be looking at what we're doing to the water with chlorinated substances and also the carcinogenic potential of multiple dioxins. So uh, we've had a very profound personal um, testimonial. The, the picture on the left is the famous garbage bin of one of my uh, now transplant patients, but she would tell me, is there anything you can do about all this garbage? She was on next stage uh, and she, this is one week worth of her garbage. So uh, in Victoria, the pickup is done every two weeks and uh, they kept leaving her nasty notes, stop overfilling your garbage, we're gonna charge you. She would take her second week worth of garbage to her breast Brother's place. He lived in a condominium and she would just put it in the dumpster in his condominium because she couldn't afford to pay for it. And on the right, the plastic waste um, from a single dialysis treatment. Sadly, we're familiar with all of this, so I won't go through each one. Um, but I was asked recently to speak at a UK um, kidney association. It was called a climate clinic. Um, and I thought, oh, this is great. They wanna learn about what environmentally sustainable stuff we're doing in Canada. This is so wonderful. And they said, can you speak on your climate disasters? I was like, oh no, like what a way to be known. So I, I, put, I put these together and, um, and then at the, at the end it was like, well, we don't see any of this stuff and this stuff doesn't really happen to us. So it was a rhetorical, why should we care? But the, you know, I think they were trying to enter their audience of why should they care and like our atmosphere is common but I think a bigger thing I want to use a healthcare analogy so we all look after patients who are stable for many years but they've got a lot of risk factors and then one day the MI comes or the stroke comes uh, or the kidney failure comes and so the forests are kind of like that they're just getting insults every day like our ecology is totally changing and so the forest fire is that event, right? We all pay attention when the forest fire comes, but this is happening all the time, every day. And so I just mentioned this because I think these environmental determinants of health are just so powerful. So there's actually data showing how we change programs. So I want everyone to be aware of that. First is strong regulations. We have strong regulatory statements, but we don't have anything holding our feet to the fire. So therefore we need committed leadership and management. So we're getting that. So many thanks to BC Renal. Uh, measurement and reporting is required and the CSN Quality Improvement Committee is working on developing uh, key performance indicators. And then we need all of you <laughs> activated and energized workforce. So yes, nephrology can be quote green. I prefer calling it environmentally sustainable kidney care, but you'll see hashtags in green nephrology. We're gonna complete our LCA work and that is gonna be really powerful to serve as a baseline to model interventions as they come. So what if there's a different type of plastic? We could model that, just stick these things into our, our data set and I think it'll be really informative. More education, more engagement, more advocacy with an idea on the advocacy being maybe CSN committee is, is gonna start looking at um, how we can better access kidney protective medications across the country. Short to medium term on every agenda of every working group and every committee and for someone to be uh, to have some special expertise in this area. The procurement I mentioned, better dialysis product design I mentioned. And then I put this, I am, I hope I'm not dreaming here, but really for us just to think differently in society as a whole, to get serious about net zero to reduce non-communicable diseases by a healthier lifestyle. And what a wonderful way to have this as part of a larger village in our, uh, our vision, in our work towards reconciliation, equity, and reciprocity. So we're gonna transition to that last theme. The new position is called a Medical Director for Planetary Health. So I'm gonna guess that most people have a general idea what planetary health is, and they probably think it's climate change and what's happening to the planet. But the actual definition of planetary health is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. And I ne it never occurred to me that that could be sort of a, uh, a Western colonial vision. I thought that was such a holistic vision. Um, but uh, Dr. Redvers, uh, who's an Indigenous scholar in this area in Canada, um, writes about uh, Indigenous value systems. And this is one, I must say, I, I want to be careful not to appropriate, but to really 
mention that this speaks to my soul, the reciprocity and responsibility which views biospheric values as human values. It's such a profound statement, and it, it's just so obvious and so common sense. So indigenous peoples live on 20% of Earth's surface, and they're in relationship with 80% of biodiversity. So leave the land. We have to leave it. So my experience. Sometimes this is a really difficult area to work in because I need to keep updated on this stuff. I'm constantly reading about things that are really tragic and really hard. And um, that can be very, very difficult. And it's especially frustrating when it seems like the rest of the world isn't changing fast enough. You mentioned the cedar trees. And I too see this because the forest is my place of refuge. I take my dog and we go for walks and we go for walks in the woods. And this is staring you in the face. And I used to take my youngest daughter in the forest and we used to look for ghost pipes. And so these are plants that grow without chlorophyll and they have a very rich fungal network that they rely upon to extract goodies from the soil to feed them. And they have not been back since the heat dome. We knew where every single one of them was. So I mentioned the cedar tree because it's this great, mighty thing. It can be. And then this lowly little ghost pipe, which nobody knows about. And this little thing that they're suffering. And so I, it's, it's a wider view of my reciprocal engagement. I think I come to work and how can I help? How can I help? We have such big systems that we have such big impact that we can all do a lot. So the truths, I mentioned about the truths. We've crossed six of nine planetary boundaries. So as I mentioned, we're not just talking about climate change. So I really truly believe that if people know the true state of Earth's ecology, they'll do all they can to live within these planetary boundaries. As kidney advocates, we need to know that climate change affects kidney health adversely. It causes more acute kidney injury, causes more chronic kidney disease. Uh, it causes more kidney stones, which are very, very costly, but can impair function. And it's changing the whole landscape of infectious illness as well. And so further, our systems um, can impact the climate because they're highly emitting. So I had mentioned that as well. So this is unintentional, of course it's unintentional, but our systems shouldn't be causing this harm. And we have capacity to improve this. The third thing, which I hope is a really key take home message is that there are solutions for climate change. The World Health Organization has numerous things. There's other websites, Project Drawdown, it's fabulous. They're just, we have to be receptive to change. And so we thought about this qualitatively that solutions are emerging for environmentally sustainable kidney care, but we need that goal, how to, that roadmap of how to get our 45% reduction by 2030 to get to net zero, to hold ourselves accountable, and that solutions are emerging that we can all use. So this vision here where we have our patient in the middle, the patient has their own role too, right? But we all have our own role. Industry has a role, regulators have a role, administrators has a role, academia has a role, clinicians, everyone. And now we have this forum to learn and to work together. So what can you do? We've worked to show the interconnectedness of Earth systems and our reciprocal relationships and our relationships to each other. Appreciate the impact of ecologic change on our health and on our spirituality. Transition anxiety into action. This has been highly therapeutic for me. <laughs> Uh, calculate your carbon footprint. You have to start here. Everyone, so I said check out cascadescanada.ca, but go to carbonzero.ca. It's made for Canada. Be prepared to get some of your energy bills and uh, go through it. But if you haven't done this exercise, what, like once you do, it'll be really intuitive where the emissions are coming from, the big categories, and for you to start thinking with that climate sense. Practice preventively and health promotion at every opportunity. Remember that care hierarchy. Keep that care upstream. Consider active transport to work. Good for your health. Um, good example to set for our patients. Um, and uh, we'll advocate for low carbon transport for patients as well. 
and then to look at these resources. So I'd mentioned Cascades Canada, but BC Green Care, um, technically they serve the lower mainland, but these are available widespread and there's lots of how-to manuals as well on the Cascades uh, and BC Green Care websites. And then we'll be working um, on our initiatives uh, with BC Renal Sustainability. So I wanna thank Chief Rakama. He came up with this topic he introduced this conversation and for me really created a safe place to introduce this. I've been talking about the very scientific aspects of this in every other talk and it was a real relief to explore this um, in a very different way. And I wanna thank collaborators and supporters of environmentally sustainable kidney care who are listed here. So we're happy to take any questions or feedback. Hello. Um, so um, just reflecting on questions that are coming up here, um, one big theme is um, waste. And I guess maybe I'll combine a few questions uh, in a twofold uh, one, which is um, how are we engaging with uh, vendors of products we purchase to incorporate uh, planetary health? And likewise, how are we engaging with either vendors or municipalities in terms of managing waste product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are important questions. And inevitably, questions in this area come from waste because we, that's what we see, right? So that's what motivates us. Um, the vendors one, I, okay, so I have to be a bit careful here because there's Caroline Stigant, the concerned citizen and nephrologist. And then there's Caroline Stigant who's transitioning into BC, uh, the, the BC kidney rolls. And then there's Caroline Stigant of the CSN and of the Green K. So um, it, it's a little bit different um, for, for each, but uh, conversations I would say is what's happening right now. And the conversations will have increasing formality as the Green K group kind of gets going on that. Um, we did have an industry session. We called it a, a green industry fair. We tried to have it sort of have a fun uh, tone to it where it was basically a chance for industry to let us know about what products or services that were environmentally progressive that they had. So um, we've been reviewing their materials online, but the, the sophistication and nature of the engagement is very early, I would say, for industry. Um, happy to advance that, of course. Um, the, the other was with the recyclers. And again, those were sort of informal conversations had with recyclers. Um, there is a group that looked to do this in BC to get the PD plastics and to get actually PVC medical plastics. And there is no local recycler who can manage these. So it takes a while for this to, to build up. Um, I think it is becoming a priority of the Ministry of Health. And there's a, a group, um, it's got a bit of an unsexy name, but the Healthcare Waste um, Community of Practice uh, is being arranged through um, Cascades Canada. So our patient partner, actually, who's a home dialysis patient on SNAP, she is joining that community of practice and they've asked us to present to them on the unique situation of home dialysis. So that meeting will happen in January. So uh, there's a pilot project in the greater Toronto area um, that is successfully um, recycling not dialysis, but other PVC plastic waste. So um, mini bags, like uh, IV saline bags, to oxygen tubing, oxygen masks. So it's very limited. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, another question which came up uh, repeatedly is around uh, patient transport and or uh, group rides that are electrified. And are we doing anything in BC Renal to support a movement in that direction. Yeah, I, I would say stay tuned as well. So uh, I'll put in a plug for the poster that myself, Dr. Ray Jen and Dr. Wong, uh, Dr. Wong being the person presenting it this afternoon, we're looking specifically at transport related emissions from uh, patients coming from home to community or um, uh, in center hemodialysis. So we have that data um, and we're gonna take that to transport officials. Um, I know this is on their radar, at least in the greater Victoria area for Handy Dart. Um, and I think, uh, I, I stay tuned for that as well, really. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. And of course, home dialysis. Prevention and home dialysis are always going to be the answers as well. And preemptive yeah. transplant. <laughs> transplant, you got it. It's in there too. Um, there is a question about what you've done to uh, greenify your office. Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, my office. Um, the, so, so there's sort of greater practice and then there's office. So uh, I don't ride my bike every day. I do ride my bike in when I can in the summer months. Um, I... I've got rid of table paper. I mean, that sounds so insignificant, but the other thing that I've done is I've gotten rid of the cleaning chemicals because we don't actually need them. I'll use um, just rubbing alcohol um, for cleaning um, and uh, just looking at reducing anything we can. You know, small things, lights out and power off and computer downtime. And we're trying not to print. You know, we've got the EMR, which has an energy requirement, but... Yeah, there's there's actually um, office setting, so uh, clinical office, and just like even in the kidney care clinic, let's say, or in the administrative offices, there's um, toolkits on BC Green Care for greening the office. Um, so I draw those to people's attention. You know, you can do improvement projects even as a board clerk. You know, um, everyone can be power empowered to make change. And maybe the last question, um, do you see carbon offsets as a reasonable short-term gap to try and mitigate some immediate harm? Uh, I'm no expert on carbon offsets. Um, I did not include my slide um, in my personal life. I have chosen to support um, the Nanaimo. There's a facility in Nanaimo. Um, it's a landfill that captures um, methane, and then they use the methane um, as a local fuel. So I think it's taken 200-something homes off the grid was the equivalent. So to me, um, local action is always best. CarbonZero.ca does have some offset options. Um, they're Controversial because of the varying quality of them. A lot of them have been demonstrated to be um, not of benefit and sort of money pockets. So I, I, I think that there are places that vet them. I've, if you're keen to do um, carbon offsets, I think that's a good, probably a good interim strategy. I think it's better than nothing, um, but please do your homework. So probably the most important one, I guess, is, you know, what can I do now? So I wonder if we can get that slide up because we put eight things there. You know, I, I would say just empower yourself, right? This is not for someone else to do. This is think differently. So I said, go to that place, calculate your carbon footprint. Look, the, the website's actually really helpful. It gives you ways that you can, this is a high impact area. Here's an idea of something that you could do. And you can do the same at work. Go, just go to uh, Cascades Canada website, go to BC Green Care. Um, think about how you can simplify. So I think if you're asking that question, carbon reduction is not intuitive to you and waste reduction is not intuitive to you. So I think get yourself a skill set so that it becomes intuitive to you because it's kind of living as a citizen in an era of climate change is the basic thing. And then we can help sort of educate patients on that and we can trickle this through our systems. So if these slides will be available, will they? Perfect, okay, so there was the eight point things there of what you could do. So please start with checking out those two websites. Thank you very much to both our speakers. Oh, thanks. I, have, I have one more thing to say, please. Um, in my thank you from yesterday morning, I forgot one very important person. That was Francine Coslin for her part in, in getting us through that horrible, horrible morning. And uh, thank you all very much.